Yes. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. Like always, my name is Josh Corporal, streaming live from Key West, Florida, and you are on the porch right now. Welcome to the porch. I have extremely special guest, Hap Klopp, on the show. Hap, it's a pleasure. Welcome to Fire Builders Live. Thanks, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here. I am excited about this about this entire interview. Ever since we first spoke, I haven't been able to get it off of my mind. And let me, before we get into the meat of our conversation, let me explain to people uh, listening at home what it is that we do on this show. Uh, we stream live Wednesdays, Fridays. We bring on amazing people like Hap here. And we take these big ideas and we break them down into small steps, things that you can do every single day to improve. Today is going to be a doozy. Let me let me explain to everybody. You might have heard of a company called the North Face. Uh, the founder and the former president and CEO of the North Face, Hap Klopp, is someone who absolutely exemplifies the adventurous leader. After selling the highly successful mountaineering company, which, by the way, has been honored with numerous awards for being the best managed, the most environmentally responsible com company in its industry, uh, he has begun an international management consulting firm called HK Consulting, operating out of Berkeley and Tokyo, and continuing to pass on this field-tested knowledge that he has acquired to the rest of the world. He has written not one, but two critically acclaimed books, Conquering the North Face and Adventure in Leadership, and almost 12 electric months chasing the Silicon Valley dream. Now, it's interesting because... This entire interview today, I mean, you don't honestly build one of the strongest global brands in the sport and apparel business without a clear understanding of who you are as a company. And your DNA is not simply just the stuff that makes you unique. It also serves as the bedrock foundation of identity in the face of constant change, marketplace innovation, competitive disruption, you name it. And finding that DNA is incredibly important. And that is exactly what we are gonna be talking about with Hap today. So Hap, I am so honored to have you on the show. It is a pleasure, sir. Welcome again to Fire Builders Live. Again, as I said, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Hopefully I can share a few things that are of, of interest and perhaps even applicable to other people. I have absolutely no doubt. Uh, I like to start the show off by asking you, so where are you in the world right now? And what is a typical day like in your life these days? Well, I'm in Berkeley, California. Uh, that's where I started the North Face after I left Stanford Business School. And uh, I've just stayed here ever since that time. Life is crazy. COVID is was an accelerator, if nothing else, of what we're doing. So uh, a typical day, I do some teaching at a university called Holt University. They have campuses across the globe. Uh, they have them in Boston, San Francisco, London, Shanghai, Dubai. And I teach a variety of things along with a couple of partners there. We call ourselves the Three Amigos. So we give different perspectives on it. But uh, just finishing a course on sustainability and the circular economy, also teach uh, based on branding, also teach things on basically talking about uh, developing global businesses using a Silicon Valley perspective. Couple that with, I usually do a little bit of consulting work. I sit on uh, two or three boards. I do some writing and uh, I do speaking. Now, I have not done any speaking physically outside of my desk for the last year, but that'll change as it comes back. But uh, have you gotten have you gotten invitations to come physically to some places yet? Uh, yeah, yeah, but just recently. Uh, it's just opening up in California, uh, but I have vaccination now, so I feel a little more uh, liberated and and be able to go out and and uh, try to extrapolate. But I've, I've learned to adapt to it. One of the things I'm doing as part of my teaching is developed a whole new process on how to uh, teach online and what the future of education is going to be, higher education. Uh, worked with a couple of my colleagues and about seven uh, interns for the last year. We've developed a whole concept about hybrid and how that's going to develop. Uh, it's an entire thing that's shifting from uh, teaching to, to learning, 
where the students are in charge, the, the arc of power has shifted. It used to be the institutions that had control and now, and it was accelerated by uh, COVID, but now the students are really in control and they want something that's accessible, affordable, and convenient. And that isn't necessarily what a four-year campus is. Maybe it works if you're at Stanford or Harvard or Yale, but when you're going to uh, campuses that are maybe not as driven by endowments and not as driven by you know, the, the legacy names, people want the education that's there and they're gonna have to get it in other ways. And, and teaching and hybrid is, is going to be quite different. Uh, there is a, probably a metaphor that people should be looking at and that is studios, uh, studios on TV. Uh, that is where we've had a combination of, of people in the studio and over the TV. That's what's going to happen in hybrid. It's pretty exciting. The democratization of education is pretty exciting. And the ability of people to either have synchronous or asynchronous learning is going to be more attractive to people. So anyway, spend a lot of time on developing that. We're actually going to do a master class, uh, I guess, tomorrow. Uh, trying to tell people some of the things we've learned. So that's that's kind of the things I do. But, uh, you know, I also get out a little bit. I try to walk every single day during the uh, uh, the pandemic, do a little bike riding, do a little. Uh, Berkeley's fairly close to the hills here. So uh, so there's no normal day, but normal chaos. <laughs> right. It just adapting like and I, I can completely relate. Uh, I do this show outside. And literally for the last three months, it has been beautiful days here in Key West every single day. And today is a massive storm <laughs> blowing through right now. And so you should see this background. I've got tarps and stuff pasted and taped up everywhere. Uh, you just got to adapt, whatever just life throws at you. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, let me put this up. Uh, uh, a couple of people watching, right? So Sterling says, slam dunk intro. <laughs> Adam, uh, Adam Pixler says, I bet Elvis is just a static welcome, Hap. By the way, Hap, uh, if you hear Elvis or anybody mention Elvis, I have been doing this show consistently since the start of COVID. And because I'm in Key West, there are roosters, wild roosters that just roam the streets like gangs here. And one <laughs> in particular likes to harass me on the show. It's become almost an unofficial co-host <laughs> named Elvis. So you might hear him during Great. this episode. <laughs> uh, and so let's see, Tara says, uh, uh, this is my mother, by the way, a joy to see your North Face face, Mr. Klopp. It's been waiting to see, uh, been waiting to see and hear your conversation. Welcome, sir. Uh, this is, this is great. Of all of the things that you now teach, particularly in a hybrid model, I'm curious, because it was a lot, you covered a lot. What's your favorite topic? Well, my favorite topic is really around brandy, of course, as you might imagine from the North Face itself. And and branding is not, uh, you know, it's not a logo. It's not a tagline. It's uh, it is your DNA going back to where your topic was. It's understanding what your DNA is. Once you understand what that is, then you can consistently represent that persistently, consistently to the outside world. And you can build a great business because if you use storytelling around the elements of your DNA, then what you can do is you don't worry when you grow about the train running off the tracks because you have great people going a lot of directions. They all adhere to that DNA and they, they select themselves in as they're going to. And, and what we used to do at North Face was every two years we'd have a long-range planning program where most people just look at quantitative numbers and we do that but we spend as much time qualitatively talking about our dna and come back to what the points are and i'll, I'll say what those points are later on but we come back to those and agree on what they're going to be for the next few years going forward and then what i would say at the close of that meeting which was sort of banal to the people who've been around but interesting to the people that were new which was I hope we are so clear in what we decided that some of you leave the business, not because you aren't great. I mean, we hired you because you're great. But if you have other ideas uh, that you want to implement, we can't be all things to all people. We only can be what we are to ourselves. So if you want to do it in a different way, what we've told you is we're not going to do it anything from this. We'd prefer to help you find a place to land where they embrace what you want to do rather than have you here fighting us so that we can all be on the same page. 
anyway, so dropping back to so what what we did and what I did from day one was come up with three words that represented the company. And those three words had to be used by everybody in the company, whether you're in product development or whether you're in finance or whether you're in customer service or whether you're in supply chain, you name it, whatever. People think, well, it's easy to come up with three words. It isn't easy to come up with three words that cut across everything. And, and the three words we chose were disruption, quality, and triple bottom line. By triple bottom line, I mean an equal commitment to profits to the planet and people. So, and if you use hyphens, it's one word. So anyway, they, <laughs> so, so those three words, and then what we would do is we would ask people to apply those to their aspect of the business. And then we would find stories within the company about the application of that, that we would tell. And it was originally word of mouth. Now they use it in the same way, but it's more social media that sends it out there. But when you tell a story, it, if people hear it from me, it, you know, they kind of think I'm a homie and say, yeah, of course he'd say it. But the person I tell it to, if they tell it, now it gains a little more credibility. And when you get yeah. to the third ring, it's, it has truth associated with it. So, so just to give you some idea in terms of disruption, what we did is we started the company, we used materials from the Vietnam War to convert camping to what became backpacking. We took aircraft aluminum and we made lightweight tent poles and, and pack frames. We took parachute cloth and we made sleeping bags and tents and some funky clothing. And doing that, we lightened the load by 50% that people carried. And so the idea was they could then go miles into the wilderness rather than a few hundred feet off of the roadbed. And we were trying to change the world. That was our belief under what we were doing. And part of it was subscribing to Thoreau's uh, dictum, which was in wildernesses, the preservation of the earth. And we believed that we needed to preserve the earth. We believed in sustainability and environment, but we believed that the way people would, would come to our side and agree with us was by actually going deep into the wilderness. It's a, an experience you have when you come back, you're refreshed, you aren't charged with all the things in the city. At the time we started the company, it was the 60s, and it was as tumultuous as today. Uh, we had the Vietnam War, anti-Vietnam War. We had rioting in the streets and whatever. But anyway, so our disruption was about materials, and we continued to change that. But also our business model. Can I Wait, can I stop you real quick right there? I just, Absolutely. Quick question. So just for context, using lightweight materials, using um, you know fabrics from the Vietnam War, what, so that everybody knows, what was being used before all of this? Canvas was being used in terms of, if you looked at packs, lots of time, there was something called the Trapper Nelson pack. It was canvas on board uh, that you did out there. Uh, we made one that used nylons, lightweight nylons, and we coupled it with aircraft aluminum that was excess. And uh, it was reasonable in terms of cost because it was excess from the Vietnam era, which was kind of ironic because we were protesting the Vietnam while we were using the materials that were developed for that. But, you know, <laughs> you, you can take bad into good, I guess, something about plowshares and, and <laughs> as we move forward. So, uh, and if you looked at the tents, generally the tents are made out of heavy material. Uh, we tried to make ones that, that the challenge was, and it comes back to quality, uh, which was our second word, which is that we believed in making a product that was the best. And we underscored that by putting a lifetime warranty on our product. And when you put a lifetime warranty on lightweight materials, it's a challenge. You have to make sure that it's there, but, but we believed that the most environmentally responsible product was not one made from recycled materials, but rather one that was actually never ending up in the landfill. So by putting a lifetime warranty on something, I mean, some things failed or needed repair, but we did that at no charge with the idea that we'd extend the product use. But in doing that, in terms of quality, now everybody we dealt with knew where we stood. So if it was a vendor and they would come to us with kind of fabric that, well, you know, if anything goes wrong, we're coming back to you. So some people quietly walked away and said, they're crazy, as did some of <laughs> by the way. Uh, frankly, the lifetime warranty 
never cost us more than one and one half percent of our sales, even in the years where we had real glitches in what we were doing. And I firmly believe it was a better position than you would ever have from the standpoint of, of advertising or marketing. You exactly. spend one and a half percent of sales, you know, you, you don't show up in today's world. I mean, there's 500,000 registered brands out there. And to presume you're going to stand out with a meager advertising campaign of even, you know, a million dollars or $500,000 or initially maybe a hundred thousand dollars you got to do something different so by standing out by using that storytelling about quality that that really built what we're doing and and, and, and got point, people got people so enamored by you you know like uh you know it's that it was that peace of mind whenever you buy a piece of equipment that you spend some time thinking about and invest in uh knowing that that you guys have their back you know yeah. uh you can't, that's incredible brand loyalty. Well, you know, we made products for people who were doing extreme things where their lives depended on it. We mm -hmm. had people going to Mount Everest and the top of Mount Everest. In fact, I had somebody call me up one time early in our career, uh, Sir Chris Bonington from England, who was a very famous climber, and as the sir might suggest in his name. And he said, you know, I'm going to Everest next week uh, and would love to have one of your tents. Could you get it to me? And I said, well, for sure. Luckily, I'm, I'm going to be in London tomorrow and uh, I'll bring it with me. I actually wasn't going to be in London, but I suddenly was. <laughs> and so I took a product off of our production line, handed it to him at his home. And the following week, he was using it at Everest. He wasn't testing it. He believed in what we were doing and the materials we had. And, uh, but people did depend on what we were doing. So that was important. I mean, we outfitted somebody who rode a boat from the tip of South America uh, to the Antarctic, and we provided clothing for that environment. It was pretty extreme and turning upside down in, in the waters there. That's pretty, pretty amazing. But w when you made it for those people, and we used that because, one, they tested our product. They were great influencers for the rest of the market, but also it spoke to the level of quality that, that we had that we developed there. So we developed storytelling. The storytelling initially was primarily about, you know, the lifelong warranty. Frankly, we added another story as time went on because uh, while we had a great warranty and we're pretty righteous about it, a lot of people had warranties and they were really shams. Uh, you know, you'd go in and they say, oh yes, you do have a warranty, but the, the small time period says, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it, it decreases to ten percent a month, and you've had it nine months. So we're going to give you a ten percent application towards buying another one of our shitty products, and you know, <laughs> and and so we we looked around for a story that would show even more audacity on our part in the extremes we would go to for our customers. So uh, the the story we used was one about Aisha, who was running our warranty department. And she had some people come in and I'd given her the latitude within budgets to be able just to make the customer happy, because I firmly believe the faster you solve something, the happier people were. And no matter what you did, if it took about six weeks for a person to get resolution, you, you could not satisfy them. So she knew that that was the charge. And the people came in and they said, you know, we were planning to go on our trip this summer and we've been planning all year and the tents failed and we need to have it repaired or it's going to destroy our vacation. She said, not to worry. You know, we're like you. We go out all the time. We know how important the trip is. I've got capacity. I'll, I'll, I'll get it done. And the person said, well, you know, there's, there's one little problem. I said, what is it? She said, well, it's not your tent. It's your competitor's tent. Okay. And she said, you know, who are they? And, is, and she said, well, you know, we know them. They make great products. We can fix it. You know, we know how to fix product. And they said, yeah, well, how, how much will it cost us? I said, well, we don't charge for repairs. And we fixed it. They went out and for no charge. Now, they may have been scamming us and probably were, but the story is worth it. Because Legendary. Told, spreads told, like wildfire. Every, everybody had heard it, whether it was inside the company or outside the company, what we were doing. And as I said earlier, maybe I didn't reference it, but you know, first people that should t be telling your story are all your employees, but they need to know what the story is. So if you can have these three words and they all hear it, when you have this long range planning process, that's how we got it uh, insinuated into the company, 
using that, then they start telling people. And of course, the third and fourth party telling it, it really underscores what you stand for. And did you, at the very beginning, were you, who came up with the three words? You and a kind of group? Yeah, yes. You know, we drank a lot of beer. We were pretty good at that. <laughs> that was that was our, our long suit. But we would, after work every day, we would, almost every day, we'd have some beer and we'd talk about what we were doing and why we were doing it. And we did it because we're kind of friends and we did it because we liked beer. And, it, you know, it, you have all these formal things that you have in business. You know, you have groups that get together. There's nothing like just sitting down over a couple of beers with some people and talking about it. And somebody says, you know, that's bullshit. You know, it's not going to work. It, you know, come on. And you, you argue back and forth and people talking about their philosophies. But in doing that, you kind of hone what you're doing. And in fact, you, you end up coming up with some reasonably good ideas that if you don't worry about, you know, whether it's going to be challenged or not, you'll throw something out. It may be a little weak at the outset, but then you can build on it and build on it and really make something great. And I'll, I'll give you one story out of that, just to give you an example of how it developed. We'd gone for quite some time. We were developing the company, but we're still drinking beer. And, and we were talking about an issue, which was, uh, I remember one employee, I won't use his name now, but he was one who was constantly requiring handholding. And he did it so he'd get noticed. It's like having a kid, you know, if he acts up all the time, he gets noticed. But then we realized that sort of osmotically over time, we were devoting more time to Dominic's and the people like him than we were to the best employees in the company, which was just ass backwards. I mean, you know, that we should be devoting time to the people that are really contributing. So we said, well, how can we do that? What can we do, you know, to show them what we really care about them? And we, and so we said, well, you know, we could come up with an idea. I mean, the worst job in our company was something called trimming. And they're basically, they were scissors that you would use to trim off the threads at the end of the time. So it would look like a finished product. And you, if you do that all day for eight hours, that's a lot of hard work. But it was also the last quality control point that we had. That person saw every seam that we were doing. So it was very important, but it was tedious, monotonous. So he said, okay, why don't we give them an award? And what we will do is take some of the trimmers, we'll bronze them, and we'll put them on We'll put them on a board and I'll write some poem about how much we care about you. <laughs> and so we used the pegboard and we did that. We bronze these things and we gave out the Golden Trimmer Award. Well, it, we, we thought it was pretty good, but I didn't realize how good until about two years later when, when Gloria Nabilek invited me to her home along with some of the other management because she had gotten her citizenship in the U.S. She'd come from Czechoslovakia, but she'd come into the U.S. And, and there, like two years later, maybe three years later, on her mantle was the Golden Trimmer Award. Now, I mean, frankly, if I knew it was going to last three years, I probably would have thought more about the poem and maybe we would have spent more than the, you know, the few dollars we spent on putting the gold together. spray paint and everything or like yeah, <laughs> that kind of yeah, thing. It would have been pretty good. But I mean, the reality was that all came from us talking after work about you know, the fact that we really need to do is make sure we focus on the people who are really contributing. So we, we use that, you know, and, and we're able to build. So coming back before I get away from the three words, uh, because I can go on for quite some time, but the third one is triple bottom line. Uh, and profits, I mean, people would say that, you know, well, of course you're a profit business. I, I didn't hire anybody at the outset that had any business training. What I believed is because I had an MBA and run a family company, I believed I could train business principles. But what I couldn't train was passion, passion for the outdoors, and passion for changing the world. So what we looked to hire were the people who were really brilliant and whatever that had those two passions. Then my challenge was to be able to educate them. And we would use that long range planning and we'd use budgeting and all the techniques that you might use, sort of the tactical ways you run a business, but getting the right people there, you know, getting the right people on the bus and then getting them in the right seats. So uh, it turns out that 11 of the people that are with me at the outset ended up starting or running other major outdoor companies. 11. Uh, yeah. That's one great. Them, one of them ran Mountain Hardware. They started that company and built that. Another one ran uh, Birkenstock. Another one started a women's athletic company called Title IX, which is performance women's athletic 
year, another one at a, a travel good company called uh, Travel Light. Someone ran the international uh, division of Patagonia. Somebody also ran ACG's uh, operations. Uh, the ACG is division of Nike. So, uh, so we must have done something that way. We did have the commitment. Our, our second commitment was, uh, frankly, in terms of the environment. We called it environment at that time. We didn't know how to spell sustainability, nor did it exist. But we <laughs> believed in, in the lifetime warranty. We believed in that. And, and we would do whatever we could you know, within the company. We would save materials in the cutting room. We made some jackets out of spare pieces that were out there, you know, the, as opposed to throwing them away. We, in the spare time, we'd have people in the design and repair area make jackets that actually utilize these pieces. We have a variety of colors. Uh, we would give our materials, for example, the filling material we had, we would give to our employees so they could make things like toys, stuffed toys, and uh, they could sell them on their own. We didn't charge them anything for it to be able to reuse that. We worked on having when we sent expeditions to places like Everest, we would have them bring back more trash than they took up because most people were leaving oxygen bottles and whatever, because the whole goal was to get up there and not to get back. So we would do that. But anyway, as part of that environment, we, we had all of those things running through our company. But but what we did more than that, to be able to get the word out, we decided we develop a a sort of jujitsu award, recognizing that people sort of resisted at that time. They still seem to resist it, strangely, the environmental message as there's something wrong with it, you know, climate change, you guys, you know, becomes political and whatever. We knew there was pushback. When we started the company, the pushback is people said, oh, you know, you're tree huggers, you're, you know, granola lovers, you know, you, you, you know, whatever. And so we decided that if we just argued that it wouldn't work, but maybe if we flipped it around, we could work. So we created this negative award and we, the negative award we gave to the most environmentally destructive organization in the world, but we based it on some humor. We based it on Kurt Vonnegut's <laughs> book, The Cat's Cradle. In, in The Cat's Cradle, the protagonist was a scientist who had a great invention that was going to convert all of the water in the world into ice. Now, of course, that was going to destroy the world, but, well, it was in the book, it was called Ice Nine. And so we created the Ice Nine Award in deference to uh, to Vonnegut and whatever. What we thought was, if anybody knew it came from Vonnegut, they know there's a little sense of humor in it. Uh, but and it wasn't actually telling people to be environmentalists. But when we gave the award one year to the U.S. Congress, I'm getting all of these letters from congressmen's aides, and you'd be surprised how many they have saying, "You don't know what you're doing, and you don't know what you know." We're just going, "Yes, we do." <laughs> We're building our brand and selling our message and sending it across. So anyway, that that is how we did that. And in terms of both disruption and also in terms of society, uh, we did a number of things. The first one was we spoke 14 languages in our, our factory. Uh, we translated in writing, writing into five languages, but 14 was languages and dialects. So we could hire anybody. And we didn't care where they came from, what their sexual persuasion was, what their ethnicity was. We just wanted to hire the best. Just and as long as they're, they show up, they're hard workers, they have the passion. Then, then come on board. And of course, that helped us as we expanded internationally because we had this polyglot of, of people that are out there. But it allowed us to do that. And it allowed us to, you know, to take stands that others didn't. We were one of the first uh, organizations, businesses in the world to uh, bring awareness to the AIDS cause. We, I believed it was the right thing to do. Also believed that a macho company like ours uh, could make an interesting statement because initially uh, people won't remember it that much, but initially there was this homophobic approach of, you know, it's a gay disease. And as a result, people weren't addressing it as opposed to it's a disease, we've got to solve it and whatever. We thought by getting behind it and using our capabilities to do that, articulating, we'd magnify it and we'd be showing our social responsibility to the world where we're going. And then we did very simple things, which to me seemed so logical, but they, they weren't. We paid women the same as men. At the time we started it, women paid 50% of what men were paid for the same job. Again, if you want the best people, you know, how could you do that? So what we would do is go through each one of these and say, how, how does it apply? How does it apply to our, 
our HR practices? How does it apply to the customers we deal with? How does it apply to the vendors we're dealing with? What do they believe in? And if they if they don't believe in the same things we believe in, then we aren't going there. So ultimately, we called that the brand of the North Face. But when we kept coming back to it again and again and again in every way, every time we touched somebody on the outside or the inside of the company was touched in the same way, which is like coral. You know, coral grows very slowly, imperceptibly, really, uh, but it becomes very complex. And as it becomes complex, it becomes more and more interesting. At a certain inflection point, you reach something that's absolutely not comparable. There's nothing like it, which in business is known as a monopoly, but that's how you create that brand monopoly. So that's that's what we were trying to do. But it requires consistency in terms of doing that as you build. Okay, so so let me show you a couple of things that came up while you were telling some of these stories because this is fantastic. First of all, uh, my buddy Billy here, he is just loving all of this, everything that you're saying. Eleni says, storytelling is absolutely great in cultivating connections, which you clearly exemplified, right? Uh, Lyndon, Lyndon says, half secret ingredients for determining company DNA, beer and bronze. That's really all you need. <laughs> uh, Sterling saying, preach. Um, the question here, so see if I can look over this. As a woman Marine vet of the Vietnam era, using materials for your products from a war when so many of our service went, men and women gave their lives, did you ever consider giving those products a tagline like this product is in honor of America's military best? Just curious because Vietnam vets are my favorite heroes. We, we, we didn't consider that, although it's a great idea. Uh, at, at the time we were doing it, we were worried that we didn't want to be totally tied to the, the negatives in the city. There, uh, people were marching and whatever, and, and we were trying to be a positive message. And what she was suggesting would be a very positive message. But if you got it in the middle of, of a military argument, you're going to have half the world disliking you and the other half. And we didn't want to end up in that argument. We thought we would spend more time on the argument of trying to save the wilderness uh, that was out there. And, and obviously we didn't do a very good job because you look at what's happened to the wilderness. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the young people now see it. But in terms of the amount of plastic that's in the ocean that you have right now, there'll be more plastic than fish by the year uh, 2050, for sure. Uh, you, if you look at what the air is, all those things. And and we we were hoping that by sending these people out, more people would recognize it and would become uh, become more advocates for being good stewards. And, and so we thought that was the battle that we we're doing. But but her point was a good one. And if I were to do it today, I, I would definitely uh, incorporate that message in there because I think you could have that expanded message within the context of the three words we were doing. Well, I would absolutely say that you guys had a massive effect. I mean, uh, we will never know but I would say of all of the initiatives, bringing trash back from Everest, right? Helping with, with everything that you guys had done collectively, uh, we're in a much better place than we would have had been had you not done any of that. Uh, and besides, it was incredibly inspirational for people to, to contribute to you know, benefiting the environment in their own way, even if it's not going and bringing back trash and oxygen bottles from the top of Everest kind of thing. Uh, but I have to say that of everything that you have talked about and the company culture that you guys had built, which sounds incredible. And had I been born in the 60s or been alive back then, I would have seeked you guys out to come and join you. Uh, do you think that it's possible to do the same types of things today? Like do, do folks um, building a business and wanting to create a standpoint and a company brand and DNA do you think they have an easier or maybe a harder time or you know, maybe I think, I think it's comparable. You just have to have the audacity, go out and do it and make sure you don't care when people tell you you're crazy. But I think if you did something around uh, sustainability and the circular economy, the idea of, of making your company circular, you would you, you would have something that's really worthwhile. And as you said, you know, you would have raced to work for us. We, you know, we didn't need to use uh, headhunters to be able to find employees to come in. We, we had people out there. In fact, I, I ran an ad one time 
uh, I can't remember what the position was, but it was for something in accounting or finance. And we had a thousand responses. You know, here, here we're a company that, you know, we were maybe a thousand employees total, but we had a thousand applications for one job because people wanted to work with us. And, and I think you could do that now. And, and there's a lot of opportunities to make money while doing well uh, in this world. Uh, so it isn't like you have to totally uh, put on sackcloth and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to live as a hermit or I'm going to, you know, go up to some monastery and I can't do it. You, you can do good things and still have a relatively nice income. Maybe you aren't going to be a billionaire, but, you know, that's that's probably OK. One hundred percent. I think that and even even in an online environment, the same idea, you know, the things that you can do to. Um, maybe not go out and bring things back, uh, clean up the environment in a physical sense, but raise awareness. I mean, there are, there are some people doing some pretty incredible things, kind of like corralling folks into a singular idea, a good positive idea for the environment. And I think it, it's incredibly commendable. Uh, and I'm, so I, you've touched on a lot of stuff, but I'm curious of the three words and of these things that you talked about that, solidified North Face, honestly, as, as an amazing brand, as an ideal that you would want to get behind. I'm curious. I ask people this all the time on the show. There's a lot of folks that watch this show that are trying to do their own thing. They're trying to do good for the world, but then they're also trying to make a little bit of money at the same time. To come up with that brand, to come up with that ideal, those three words, so to speak, um, what do you suggest that they do? What can they do to start? I, I think you run across a whole bunch of words. I, I, there was a great quote from, I believe it was Goethe, which is saying, the, you know, the philosopher, the German philosopher said, whatever you can do or believe you can, begin it, because boldness has genius and power and magic in it. And, and the reality is the way you come up with the words is start coming up with words and then then eliminate the ones that don't quite work. But but I would do it if you wanted to get it down to one uh, that you would live by. You know, if I were to do it right now, probably the word would be, as opposed to three, the one would be the best. Because I think the best is something which people have abandoned uh, in this, uh, as we've raced towards making things cheaper, uh, as we've gone offshore to find uh, cheaper manufacturing to be able to do something. There's very little competition for making the best. There's a lot of competition for making it the lowest cost, but the lowest cost has tremendous cost if you look at it. The first one for the environment. Uh, there's fast fashion, throwaway clothing, and it all ends up in the landfill, and that's that's not good. And if you not but, the best, but but if you make the best, it requires a lot of work to do it. But you're competing with very few people right now and it, it's a place that you can go ahead and then if you believe in that then every day you just write it down and look at it and put it on your wall and say that's what we're going to live to i i put a uh, a quote on the wall of our design department which we kind of adhered to along the strategy and it was it was a quote from rudyard kipling and in, in his book the mary gloucester where it said they copied all they could copy but they couldn't copy our minds. So we left them sweating and stealing a year and a half behind. And that, that was sort of our idea. We're going to make something new and better and the best all the time. And we didn't want to spend a lot of money on patents. We'd rather spend it on inventing new things. We didn't want to spend a lot of money uh, trying to drive costs down so we get the last customer. We wanted to get the customer who was happy. We wanted to make our customer our best salesperson because of their love of what we were doing. I think that's amazing. The uh, like one, I love Riyard Kipling and mm -hmm. two, that idea of being the best, even though sometimes it's arguable that the best is subjective. It can yep. be subjective in some way, shape or form, but it's like one of those things that, you know, like, you know, you're doing, the right thing. There's a, a friend of mine, Chris Winfield, has this quote: "The you know the extra mile is never crowded," um, yeah. and that's that sounds like exactly what you guys did. There, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that you'd say when we make the best quality. Sometimes it precludes you from doing 
uh, certain aspects. For example, when we were uh, starting in the North Face, a natural extension, people would say, is why don't you make day packs for kids in school? And we, we never were, we made a few, but we didn't really emphasize that. There were companies out there like Jansport and Eastpac and whatever that did a lot better than us. The reason is we wanted to make a product that lasted forever. When you were making a day pack for kids at school, the last thing they wanted was a product that was going to last forever. They wanted one that was going to last for the year, and then they wanted to get a new one the next year, maybe sometimes with animals on it or, or Some whatever. Some zebra stripes or something like that, yeah. And, and so what we were designing, what we believed in, in theory, fit right into that. But the reality is we had to give that market to somebody else because of what the, the nature was. And, and sometimes having these guidelines that are so clear allows you to make uh, negative decisions, negative not in terms of anything other than we choose not to do that because or we abandon that market because it isn't ours. But then the focus allows you to be really good at the things you're good at. I, uh, I think that's that for lack of a better term, that like that forced prioritization of understanding you know, who you guys are, and what you will do, but more importantly, what you won't do and making those tough decisions. Uh, I think that's, I mean, of course it's smart and it's, uh, it's something that people could do, could do a little bit better at. I know that there's a lot of people that struggle because you, you do kind of want to like have the tendency to please everybody a lot of the time. But you just have to realize that that's the fastest way to really not please anyone. Yeah. Who likes music? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay. So, uh, so if that's the case, um, the consistency part, coming up with the words, honestly, just, just doing, just, <laughs> I love that, you know, just, spending your time not worrying about people copying your stuff and 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 getting yourself wrapped up in all of that but instead pushing forward pushing the boundaries what is the bleeding edge here and and how far can we take this uh you know if you do that if somebody took your advice today they started today you started doing that consistently as a company and as a brand, in your experience, like what did you find was happening? Do you, do you still have the the people that were chasing and nipping at your heels, but you just didn't didn't pay any mind to them, and you were able to accelerate forward? Yeah, you usually can separate yourself from the crowd, and that's what you really want to do in business. Uh, you know, it's it's difficult to be recognized unless you stand out, and you can stand out by differentiation. So you can do with that. Now, you have to recognize that not everything you try is going to work, and you, you have to avoid the fear of failure. You know, doing nothing ensures failure in today's world, so you got to do something, but not everything will work out. So I, I think it was Edison who said, you know, I've never failed. I just found 10,000 ways something won't work. I mean, it's kind of that same way. You try it. If it doesn't work, you, know, you throw it away, and what you do is just make sure that you sort of bound the risk of what you're pursuing. Jeff Bezos said, at Amazon has what he calls the two pizza rule. And he said, whenever I start something, I want the group to be small enough it can be fed with two pizzas. Any larger than that is too large a group. Said, <laughs> His basic reasoning is that if you decide you're gonna boil the ocean and invest all this money, you won't cancel the idea no matter what because the failure is catastrophic to your company. But, it, but if you have a lot of these little pods that are trying something, some, some will fail, many of them fail, throw them away. You, you sort of design thinking, which is set a hypothesis, test against it, throw those things that don't work, focus on the things that do, and then that's where you invest additional money in growing. That's, that's how you expand. So you don't have the fear of failure because it's not gonna take it down. And what you have is the joy of discovery on those that do work. I like the joy of discovery. I like that. I like the way that that's said, because you're right. It's, I mean, very much like, uh, cause I have a mechanical engineering background and that's exactly what you would do in any experiment. You would make a hypothesis, test it out, see what the hell happened and then change something if it needs to be changed. And if it doesn't, then push it even farther forward. Uh, I think that's amazing, really great advice. Okay, so, Hap, if people are listening right now, which they are, 
and they want to connect with you. They want to ask you a question. They want to uh, find out what you're doing. How do they do that? What's the best way? And uh, what do you have going on these days? Well, there's a variety of things. I'm on LinkedIn. So if anybody wants to connect with me there, I, I generally do that and use that. I've written the two books that you talked about. One's about success with conquering the North Face. The other one's about failure, going almost. It's about a company that should have succeeded in Silicon Valley but didn't. Uh, it's all using storytelling, which I obviously I use longer, but but it, it talks more about my philosophy so they can do that. I'm, I'm involved in that, and I end up speaking on, on a variety of things. And then I teach at uh, uh, Holt University and uh, some other universities in extension where I sort of put my idiosyncratic ideas out there and and uh, try to share with the rest of the world for, for for good or bad. So you know, I know half my ideas are are wasted. I just don't know which half. So I leave that <laughs> to others, but but try to do that. So, uh, but love to contact with people. Love to hear ideas and and uh, uh, hopefully, you know, my experience sometimes can save people uh, from <laughs> from having the same experience. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book. They say you can learn on OPM, other people's money, uh, you know, learn on the mistakes of other people and you don't have to replicate those. And on top of on top of just learning from mistakes, it's also very inspiring to hear your take on a lot of this because to be honest, I feel like a lot of people just feel the stuff that you said, right? They, they know that it's right. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's important to be a good human. You know, I didn't mention this, but when we would hire people on tall ships, and I spent a lot of time sailing on these ships all over the, all over the world in my twenties, that was our motto as well: is that you, we would hire people that didn't have any sailing experience, but they had to be good people. And if they were good people, we could teach them sailing. Anybody could be taught how to sail. But if it was the other way around, and they were amazing sailors, but they just didn't get along with the crew or didn't have the same ideals, they got kicked off of the ship at the next port, you know, kind of thing. For sure. I, I totally support that, and I can see how it would work. So uh, so that said, I think that people just inherently feel like they want to do good in the world and that the inspiration, the things that you talked about today, uh, just – solidify that you know support that support that notion that there's it's not all just profits and 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 accountants somewhere in high rises making decisions there are people out there that are still believe in doing good uh so i think it's that's fantastic that you came on and we were able to talk about it i feel like we could swap story we didn't even get to storytelling i feel like we could swap a whole bunch of outdoor I think stories <laughs> i think we really could <laughs> well i'll tell you um open invitation for some beers. They are on me if you make it down to Key West anytime soon. Great. I, I will take you up on it. I have some friends that were next door neighbors moved down to Key West. So maybe I'll, I'll visit them one of these days. You can meet Elvis as well. Elvis the Rooster will be there. <laughs> Super. <laughs> well, this honestly, Hap, this has been great. I'm, I'm really honored that you took the time. I know you're a really busy guy. You got a lot going on, but thank you for spending some time. If you have any last minute tidbit of wisdom that you'd like to leave people? Uh, is there something that you'd like to say? Well, you know, I think what I would say to anybody else is uh, do what you want to do. That's what you'll be best at. And uh, figure out how you make a life around it. I love the outdoors. I loved that activity. I knew I couldn't work for anybody else because I had idiosyncratic ideas. And so what I decided is that I would start a business on my own. That isn't for everybody, but when I started it, the last thing I wanted to do was create exactly the environment I disliked. So I was able to choose. Uh, I love the outdoors. I love being around smart and intelligent people. I love the idea of being creative. I love the idea of building something. And so that's what I created. Every Everybody has different touchstones of what uh, what excites them. But if you figure out what you think about in the morning when you wake up, and what you think about at night when you go to bed, that's probably where you should find uh, an opportunity. And it could be business, it could be in philanthropy, it could be in uh, nonprofits and giving back, could be that. But if, if that's what you're doing, that's where you're gonna be happy. And when you're happy, you're 120%, I know. 
And if you're just you know mailing in the performance, you're you're probably not even at 100. You're probably at 80 percent. So uh, leave that to somebody else because there's probably somebody that wants to do the job that you don't want to do. And it's going to give that 120 percent. You know, that's the thing they think about in the morning and at night. Yep. Absolutely, well, Josh. <laughs> this this was so good. Seriously, Hap. Uh, I'm so we got to end it. Uh, I tell you, I had a fantastic time. I'm so appreciative. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking with me and my coworker, rooster friend Elvis, <laughs> who has been notably quiet today. I think it's the rain. Um, I didn't, didn't let him get a word in. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, he, um, if you come down to Key West, uh, we'll have to make him a tiny little North Face jacket. And so we could recognize him. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you again, guys, and everybody that's watching and listening right now. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Steven saying great interview. Thanks, guys. You're welcome, Steven. Um, this Josh Hap Elvis signing off another episode of Fire Builders Live. Join us again. To stream live noon Eastern, Wednesdays, Fridays. This has been a pleasure. Hap, thank you again. Thank you, Josh. Take All right. Care. See you guys. Bye.